Krishna Avalon is a subconscious therapist, licensed acupuncturist, psyche facilitator and internal family systems practitioner who has led over 26k patients and clients to their health and wellness goals for the last 20 years. Hello everybody, I'm so happy to have all of you today here with me on a new episode of the Healer Hub podcast. Today with me is Krishna Avalon. Hey Krishna, happy to have you on. Hello, good morning, Anka. <laughs> so I was curious about your name. Um, Avalon already <laughs> brings so many memories. Is this your name and how are you embracing uh, the Avalon part and then also the Hindu part of your name? Mm, I love that because no one ever asked me that. Uh, Krishna is my birth name, although I'm not Hindu. It actually, and I'm not Russian either, but my father spent some time in the Navy, spent some time in Russia, and between people who are very familiar, who've known each other, it means wonderful. So that's how I got Krishna, and it is my birth name, but everybody thinks I've changed it <laughs> to what it is. And then the last name that I was born with, no longer suited, and I wasn't married. And I just wanted to let go of that last name. So I chose Avalon because it's what I chose for my daughter's middle name. Mm. And what I chose for her middle name, she was born at home. She was a home birth. And what you do for a birth certificate is you sort of fill out the paperwork and then you send it in to the county to get your social security card and your birth certificate. And I hadn't had the middle name that I totally knew I wanted for her. And there was a song playing maybe two days after she was born. We had written some and we had crossed them out. And I was like, oh, I really like this song. I wonder what this is called. And I looked at the playlist and it was called Avalon. And I was like, oh, Panya Avalon. I love that. And so that's how she was given her middle name. But she does have Irish, like her dad is many things, but part of that is Irish. So it does suit her with Irish folklore and mysticism. And I chose it because I wanted a new last name and it's her name. So that's how I have it. <laughs> I love it. And I also love just the fact that you chose a different name because a different yeah, family name because it no longer suited you. So this brings my curiosity to who you are, how you define what you do in the world and what is your story. Mm. I mean, I came into this world in a really complex, complicated way. My mother was not conscious necessarily when I was conceived. And so, and she was very young and she was raised in a very Catholic family, very huge Catholic family. And so my grandparents, and I love them so much and I miss them dearly. I love them. And they were very good to me, but they did not know what to do with her at that time in a Catholic family. And so they told her to leave town mm -hmm. and not come back until she had a husband because my biological father did know about me and he chose to leave. And so the lessons that my mother came into at that time were what I was receiving in utero, those lessons, big, 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 big lessons, right? Of being kicked out of the tribe, not feeling safe, not belonging, not being accepted. You know, who am I without like my people and my loved ones? And so those are the lessons I came into the world navigating. And then being a brown girl, being raised by white Catholics, you can imagine how that was then reinforced over and over of you try to fit in where you don't belong. Mm -hmm. Or to be a good girl, you need to give and give and give to receive love and acceptance and be a good person. Because the Catholic religion that I was raised with was very like shame, victim, martyr. And so that's what I was taught, right? No boundaries. Always say yes. Mm -hmm. Always do what you don't want to do to be a good person. 
And so those are the things I was trying to navigate, which are big ones. And I'm so blessed to say that I can talk about this right now with you, Inca, and not be in story. It's not triggering. It's not making me want to cry or leave my body because I've worked with these modalities that have helped me love and accept myself for who I am, trust who I am, feel safe, at least within myself, being in whatever experience I am, not needing people's acceptance, mm -hmm. that I am inherently worthy and deserving of those things exactly as I am. That's the kind of work I've been able to do with the subconscious reprogramming because the programs I was given at birth and then reinforced, good God, those are deep and awful. And they're hard to move on from if you don't have the right tools. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, what's my story? What was my awakening? Like, it's been a continual awakening. And thank God I found these things because a lot of people never do. Yeah. Thank you for sharing so vulnerably. And I can see how you are now embodying and you took ownership over your own story. So I think that this resonates with so many people who are listening. Also, a lot of people who come from a monotheistic religious background <laughs> and a lot of women who know what the social pleasing, don't rock the boat conditioning feels like inside the body and looks like. Um, when it is projected outside in society. So you mentioned the modalities. Um, could you introduce us to what helped you along your journey and how are you supporting your clients now? Yeah, for sure. Because thank goodness I found acupuncture when I did so, so long ago. It was my first love in this life. And I found that before really people were doing acupuncture and like very much at that time in the place of having to educate people like what is this and what can i do for you and i did that i've been doing it for 21 years but about four years ago i started hearing about the subconscious mind mm -hmm. and became obsessed because i was hearing and reading and listening to podcasts where my teachers were talking about how the subconscious mind creates 97 percent of our lives Right. And so that's where our programs are stored and our memories and our habits and our beliefs. And if you don't work with that place, it's very hard to make change. And it's very hard to create life as you want it to be because most of us are in a contracted, limited, self sabotaging place with a lot of our beliefs. Like we might feel like we're deserving of this much love or this much joy or this much ease or to feel safe being who we are, but not more than that, because we've never experienced that. Mm -hmm. And so when I found this work, it was making changes for me in my life that I hadn't been able to make before. And when I first heard about Psych K, which is the process that I was trained in, and I don't love the name, but it stands for Psychology Kinesiology, it's Energy Psychology. I looked it up and found there was one person here in Portland, Oregon that was offering sessions and I went and saw her and I honestly didn't feel any different, but I knew that I wanted to train in it. And so when the pandemic hit, like so many of us, I had to pivot and shift. And I was like, I wonder if that woman is teaching classes because I knew she taught and sure enough, she was and she taught, she had been teaching here in this house that I ended up buying from her. She taught here for 12 years doing subconscious expansion work. She was teaching Psyche. Hey. And I did all three trainings with her here. My life started changing. I started offering what we call balances in Psyche hey to some of my acupuncture patients just to see what would happen. And without asking, they were giving me such incredible feedback about the things that were shifting in their lives. And so even though I knew for myself it was helping and shifting things in my life. I had to see for the people I was working with because I'd been an acupuncturist very successfully for so long. To get off of that well-oiled track, I sort of needed more proof. And then, and then it just kept going. And then with Site K, it is really powerful, the shifts that happen. But I wanted a deeper way of inquiry 
with people. And a lot of people that I get to work with have been in talk therapy for many, many years and still feel stuck or triggered or angry or avoidant. And that's because you're just working with your conscious mind, right? So I wanted a more like formal mental health training because mental health has been failing many, 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 many people. Mm. And I didn't want to be a talk therapist. But in my work, what comes to me is like people needing a talk therapist essentially, but that has the tools that can help them move on. And so that's when IFS, internal family systems, came into my awareness when I went to Costa Rica a couple of years ago on retreat. The woman that I like instantly connected with was the therapist and she was talking about IFS. And then it came up in my awareness another couple of times. And I was like, hmm. And when I looked into it, I was like, yeah, there's a way around me not having to become a licensed clinical social worker. I don't want to do three more years of schooling. I just paid off my student loans, right? And I don't want to be a talk therapist. Hmm. Um, and so I applied because it's a lottery, how you get in with IFS training. And there are people all over the world that have been trying for years and years to get in. And I got in right away. So it was like, you know, a yes, I was being guided by something higher, like, yes, follow this, this trail. And so I went into it with that intention, but it became very clear to me immediately that like, oh, I need this framework for myself <laughs> to hold these ways of being the system and this this inquiry of self for myself and then also be able to offer it to the people who are coming me to me for site k and everything else that i do because i do a few things um and it's so beautiful it's such a loving and compassionate and um it's deep yeah. it's a deep way of taking a look at what's going on inside yourself so we're going to we're going to dive a bit deeper into IFS but just before we move into that I would love to know how that how do the uh, psyche sessions with you go is it more of an energetic uh process uh do people have to be there physically in the same space with you can you do, can you do it online Yeah you can do it virtually you can do it in person so the kinesial kinesiology part of Site K, so psychology, kinesiology is muscle testing. And if we're doing a virtual session, I'm just asking for permission to muscle test on your behalf. It's very clean and simple. It's not like I'm channeling your energy or anything like that. I'm just asking for permission and then I muscle test on myself. The processes are mostly simple. So in Site K, we do balances and there are two main ones that I could just do all day, every day with people for the rest of our lives and it would be incredibly impactful but there are other balances that take longer that are also very beautiful but they're more complex or have more steps that actually do have like energy work components to them the two main balances i work with one is called the transformation of stress or trauma and so what we get to do there is we get to peacefully unattach from something that's been stressful, triggering, or traumatic, whether that's right now or the past or the future, something stressful for the future. And we get to create neuroplasticity in that if we're in like one repeated thought or pattern or feedback loop, mm -hmm. that's the way you're going to keep going. This work allows us to create another pathway in the mind so that you can have a different experience. And then the other balance that I work with a lot is what we call a goal statement. And that's when we talk about what you want. And from what you want, you come up with the right words that feel connected for you with my help if you need it, which usually people do. But of course, sort of one of my specialties is helping people come up with like the program that you're going to create now to have as your perception in the world, mm. which is very powerful because, so, go ahead. Go ahead. Can you share? No, it's just like a lot of the neuroscience shows that our perceptions for most things anyway, that our perceptions are even more impactful than our genetics. So for instance, if your perception in the world is that you are not enough, you don't have enough, 
that you're not safe mm -hmm. or your perception is that you are so grateful you have so much you're living heaven on earth that's a very different experience right and so we have these programs that are held in the subconscious mind and we get to create new ones and we get to unattach from the ones that have been destructive or hurtful or limiting or self-sabotaging and so that's the beauty of psyche for me is that you're not just uncoupling or unattaching from stress we also get to create new programs so unlike hypnotherapy or emdr or even emotion code other things that work with the subconscious and can be helpful for people in site k you get to create a new program yeah so what i hear you saying is also that you need these two steps or two phases one would be the releasing of the unuseful program so that you can actually create the goals but with a basis, a positive, <laughs> uh, nurturing basis. I love that question so much. And that is the way that I would personally guide a session. But I have had plenty of sessions with people where we'll just do like three transformation of stress balances. Mm. Just kind of clear the slate energetically of things that are taking up a lot of headspace or that you're having stress with. So mm -hmm. one balance is a lot. It's very can be very powerful, can change your life. But usually in a session, we're getting to two or three balances. I would say my inclination is to take people through one or two transformation with stress balances and then do a goal statement. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, to you know, let's make some space and let's also like nurture and like move towards what you want. Yeah. So what are usually the goals that people are uh, magnetized towards this is just to kind of confirm for everybody who's listening that we are coming from the same realm and that most of us have very similar ways of being in the world uh, so I'm curious from your experience as a professional totally I would say being believing or feeling that you're worthy and deserving of mm. being loved for who you are being accepted for who you are, being safe to be seen for who you are, trusting yourself. It's safe for me to be who I am. I trust myself. I deserve healthy love. Mm -hmm. My joy matters. Oh, and boundaries. I can empathize with others while staying in my own energy. I can say no without guilt. I mean, these are some like foundational ones for people because so many of us want to be able to be present and show love and caring, but get lost mm -hmm. in other people's energy because we don't know maybe how to stay sovereign. And so I do a lot of work helping people with that, staying connected to their own energy, returning to their own energy, clearing their field from other people's stuff for the world's suffering without guilt. Mm -hmm. You don't have to feel bad if you are not dead. You don't have to feel bad if you are not suffering and in a lot of pain every moment of the day. You don't have to be a good person by also matching the suffering of other people. You know, that is a lot of conditioning and oftentimes religious programming, especially for women. Yeah, and it's it's also, I think, a way of, I think that in everything there is an intention of love. Um, so um, now I think we are switching a little bit into into IFS. When people take on or children take on things that weren't particularly their own, because energetically they think that they are gonna unburden or take a part of the burden of their families or of their loved ones, and it doesn't happen only with children, right? It happens also with our partners or with our friends, where somehow we believe that if we are sharing that suffering, it's going to make it easier for them to carry. Exactly. When I think about it from my own daughter, you know, and like how much I feel bad when I know that I've projected my own fear onto her because I'm worried about her as a 14-year-old girl and maybe things that happened to me when I was 14. 
and then the state of the world on the internet, you know, I feel bad. And I see that being so hard for her yeah. and being in IFS, what they might call a legacy burden, right? When we take on the burdens from our, our ancestors and our family. Yeah. Yeah. So going to IFS and knowing your own personal system, how was it? How was the journey for you? So I imagine it just like any certification, you had to do your own individual work so as to be able to import it in your client sessions and to actually know the process and what it feels like for, for your clients. It's really beautiful because I didn't know, for one, how just powerful it could be to sit with a part and say hello to it and also ask what it wants to tell you and where it hangs out in its body, in your body, what its job is, how long has it had that job? So since what's age, right? Because a lot of our parts are protectors mm -hmm. that we created to protect ourselves from our exile of parts. And so the protectors can be either managers or they can be firefighters. And so how powerful it's been for me to just get to know parts and ask them those questions and check in and then ask them if they know who I am. 49-year-old Krishna now who wants to get to know them, who wants to help them, who wants to invite them into a more preferred job. And then to ask them what their fears are. And then also to learn that there are parts of me that I did not know about. And so it's been very, very beautiful even to check in with my own parts while I'm in session with a client, because even though I have been doing this for so, so long, holding space and guiding people, it's still an invitation to be like, do I have an agenda? Mm -hmm. Is my heart open? Is my body relaxed? And to be able to name that even in front of your client, seeing how that, that can help them feel safe, just naming it. Yeah. And like, even in a resonance way, sort of them being like, oh, she's not trying to like front some sort of way of being, right? Mm -hmm. And being able to slow down a big thing in IFS that they teach us is to slow down. Mm -hmm. And that's really beautiful too. You can just kind of hang out and linger. There's this process called the six F's that you go through with someone when you're in inquiry, but you could just linger in like step of one and two. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go through the whole thing. Like you have some sort of agenda to help somebody get to a certain goal. Like you can just have the client lead the way with their capital S self. And it's very, um, I really love that because the premise is that we all have parts none of the parts are bad and that we all have a capital S self that already knows what to do. That's already whole and healed. But these other parts have such extreme roles that need to be unburdened mm -hmm. and feel safe with us as our capital S self and to get updated to who we are now so that self can lead the way. Yeah. That's very really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful because it's not about me being the therapist telling you what your diagnosis is and putting you on prescriptions and this, that, and the other. It's like a, a state of inquiry, a way of inquiry to uh, ideally get a client familiar with their self to part relationship. It's very beautiful. Yeah, and so what I'm doing is like working with a part with somebody and then doing a site K balance. <laughs> And it has been so, so powerful, so profound. So. That is the blessing of mixing different modalities <laughs> in, your own, in your own practice. So thank you for speaking to the premise of IFS. Um, and when you mentioned, for example, that there is a part that could be sabotaging you, this, was, this had, has been my journey of understanding that there is no part that is actually sabotaging is a part that is just fulfilling her needs <laughs> and her needs are different than 
other parts needs and it's such a beautiful negotiation between parts and also to speak to what you were saying about the positioning between therapist or coach and the client which is an equal dignified respecting their sovereignty whereas maybe in more traditional modalities you've got that hierarchy or somebody knows better right when somebody either tells you what you need to do or medicates you or has a solution for you and not to <laughs> deny that there is there are huge benefits and we are so privileged to to be living today in a world where we have access to traditional medicine and we just take it for granted uh, but from a different type of privilege we also have the opportunity of exploring the sovereign self that is choosing its own way or its own path to becoming closer to who it actually is maybe yeah that's really well said and I have been able to practice with colleagues who have also been in training with, but I also did just seek out an IFS therapist to work with exiled parts. Mm. Somebody who's more experienced in the process because you can definitely do work with your managers and your firefighters and even speak to your exiles, but it's also very helpful and nourishing and important to have somebody who's very much in self energy be able to hold that and reflect that to you sort of as a lending of their system to help you through like a very what could be an overwhelming part to get to know and unburden and so we are taught in ifs like to work with exiles to seek a therapist seek somebody else who can basically hold space and be in self-energy as they guide you through that. Yeah. Or even if they're not guiding you through that and you are in your self-energy doing that, because that happened actually in a training. I was in self-energy. The, the person in our group that was PA, the teacher, was working with the person in the group practice that was supposed to be my therapist. They were talking for a long time. The practice was really more for the therapist. It wasn't for me. But as I was sitting there in self-energy, like doing this inquiry, I went through a complete unburdening with an exile because I, I knew they were there too, you know, or maybe I wasn't even consciously thinking that, but it was like the alchemy too, for me to be in that and go through it really on my own in self-energy with them present in case something went wrong <laughs> or I needed help. But myself knew what to do. Mm -hmm. So to your point, you know, our, our, our self, you know, other modalities or spiritual practices, may call it your higher self or God or whatever it is. But um, yeah, it knows what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these other that might need to be unburdened and give you space so you can get to know them and they can get to trust you and they can back off and they can also like maybe find a new way of of supporting you <laughs> a new role yeah i love that you know they they did statistics on babies and babies are so much more outgoing and curious when their caregiver is present than when left alone and this speaks to your experience of you are able to be in your self energy, knowing that they will not save you. But if there is anything that you feel is out of your window of tolerance that can trigger something, there is somebody who can hold space and you can reach out to. And I, I also think that everybody who, and I, I want to believe <laughs> that everybody who is in the industry of health and wellness is equally supported by a coach or a therapist because you get not only to be witnessed, which is already in itself extremely healing for so many of these parts, just to be seen and acknowledged and sometimes celebrated because as you were saying, we just ostracize them and they are bad and we don't want to have anything with them. But then the benefit is also of seeing how somebody else works, how somebody else holds space and emulate by being in the presence of, of that energy. 
Exactly. You nailed it. That's exactly what it is. Being witnessed, being seen, holding your own self energy. Mm. And just being present with somebody to, you know, be with whatever is in the room. Mm. Yeah. And be with whatever is within them. Yeah. Which is, I'm, I'm smiling because <laughs> it's such a huge thing for us in our human experience, right? To accept and allow undesirable expressions of the self and emotions like anger or rage or fear or sadness. Um, and just some, for me, this has been extremely healing and I can see it also with clients only allowing that to exist i'm afraid and that's okay i'm jealous and that's okay not not meaning that i am happy you know that i'm experiencing that or that i take a uh, pleasure and i think i'm such a great human being because I'm, I'm very jealous but just allowing it to exist because it anyhow is it anyhow exists <laughs> so saying no i don't want anything to do with that is not gonna make it disappear mm -hmm. This is going to hide it away. <laughs> I know. And I mean, I, you know, I was reflecting on this this morning and yesterday is like, you know, everything going on in the world like mm -hmm. since the beginning, maybe not the beginning of time, but hundreds of years, like all this division and separation that causes othering and like war and I'm right and you're wrong is like, you know so many of us maybe sometimes kind of feel hopeless or we're not doing enough but like what if you worked with that inside yourself mm -hmm. that separation and division what if you like you said said hello to them thank them for doing their job thank them for doing what you know also showing them like hey there maybe could be another way of being would you like to explore that mm -hmm. yeah and having a relationship and then healing and integrating and, and embodying mm -hmm. more self-energy. Yeah. So powerful. Mm. And probably the best, best thing that we could do, in my opinion. It has to start within, ideally, yeah. before we're like out in the world trying to tell other people what to do or how to be. Like Work with the division and separation within yourself. Mm. That's what I'm going to do anyway. Hmm. and wonderfully enough as you were speaking i was thinking about the impact that accepting this or allowing these parts to exist within the self makes it easier to accept undesirable aspects of your mm -hmm. partner of your work colleague of your children of the people who would usually trigger you <laughs> that is so true yeah that's entirely true because every time I would come out of a training or do some of the reflection or meditations from IFS on my own, I notice it. I notice it in my ability to listen and just be with others is even bigger. Yeah. Your point. yeah. So I'm wondering at this moment in your life, what is your biggest dream? <laughs> I really would love to be in the healthiest, most loving relationship with my daughter and myself, of course, first, but with my daughter, I believe that would be my greatest life accomplishment. Mm -hmm. But I want to, you know, I'm pretty creative as a business person. I've been a business owner, self-employed entrepreneur for 21 years. I've tried and done all kinds of things, but what I know is that people are coming to me for these certain needs and it's to transform their trauma mm -hmm. and their stress and to be in their own energy. They want to know a deeper connection. And so that's with yourself. You have to have a deeper connection and clarity and connection to yourself and then feel empowered as the creator of your life when you are creating new programs from what you actually want. And so I want to hold space for that. And that's not to dis dismiss or diminish the suffering and the pain of the world. It's not. I've told you my story. I've had to learn and outgrow many painful things. 
It's because as a human, like for me, I believe we are here to love and be loved and grow and evolve. Like why as souls would we choose to be here at this time on planet Earth? Like I'm here for the revolution of love and of empowerment and of systems changing and of oppression going away and for us to really like step into the brilliance of who we are. And so my dream is to hold space for that and to be able to offer this alternative to traditional talk therapy, not to talk crap about talk therapy, mental health, but it does fail and fall short for a lot of people. And there are other ways that do not take long, like what I am doing. And I know because I've seen it for myself and other people. And so if I get to do that, I can work less. I can live anywhere I want. I can be the most inspired as a facilitator, a practitioner, as a person who cares for other people. Mm -hmm. And for my personal energy going into this next phase of life, you know, I mentioned I'm 49. So I'm like preparing to be in like older lady life. And I say that with love. And so it'd be so nice to just feel really relaxed and supported and held mm -hmm. in my gifts and in my service to the world. So I'm so close. And I'm kind of there, but it's like, I promised my daughter that we would stay in Portland through high school, but like, <laughs> I would love to be somewhere tropical, funnier, <laughs> at least for big chunks of the year. So that's my dream. We do get to travel a little bit. So that is great. And I'm very, very grateful for that. But like in my heart of hearts, I would be doing that more. And then offering sessions from all over the world, right? So, yeah. Thank you for asking me and witnessing because that is so powerful to speak our dreams to people who see and hear us. I appreciate that. Yeah, and so it shall be. I need it to. I need to put the magical one on. <laughs> on yeah. <you>. Yeah. <laughs> what is most rewarding uh, in the work that you are doing now? It is most rewarding to show people that they don't have to earn what they want and that it can be easy because a lot of people have the beliefs that, oh, because it's been this way for 40 years, it's going to take a bunch more years to not be this way. Well, no, actually, you could just be that way now with this kind of work. And you could let it be easy. You don't have to prove with a bunch of suffering and struggle that you deserve it. You already inherently deserve it. Whatever that is for you. And for a lot of people, it really is just like healthy love, connection, trusting themselves, feeling safe to be seen, and worthy of basically support, which is money mm. and freedom and ease. Yeah. <laughs> Who is your inspiration now and why do you find them inspiring? Gosh. So many people. I mean, I'm pretty in my own little world in a way. You know, people come to me and when people are not here coming to me, I'm like in nature away from people. And so my inspiration... Um, are the trees, <laughs> the plants, the forests, the water, the rivers, nature is where things make sense for me. Mm -hmm. um, and my daughter, she is my muse 100%. And she just, she's so special. I know everyone feels that way about their kid, but she really is. And I'm just like praying daily to be the best mom I can for her and to basically like serve her highest potential because she's got so much potential mm -hmm. those are the most inspiring things <laughs> I love that and I'm so grateful that you are sharing so openly and vulnerably I I, I imagine that a lot of people don't realize how important their children are but not in the way where they need to take care of their children and guide them in the right direction, but also to allow their children to teach them <laughs> what mm 
what they need to mm. have that connection. Yes, um, yes. And I don't know, do you have kids? Not yet. Next you don't have kids. <laughs> but it's so true because um, we will parent from what we know and we'll parent from our own conditioning. And she's different than I am. Yes. So I did look into what's called our human design. Mm -hmm. She has one and I have one, right? Her design is different than my design. And when I looked into hers and got kind of a reading on mine own and hers, it was so helpful because she is the only child, quote unquote. And so if I had thought when she was younger, oh, she's going to be weird for staying in her room for four hours at a time by herself instead of actually she gets tired and needs rest and she's a designer and a drawer and she loves to just have that time to recalibrate yeah. and reconnect to herself i would have thought differently like my condition would have thought only child homeschooled during pandemic like she's gonna end up socially weird mm -hmm. but she actually doesn't want to go and go and go and go and go till she hits the pillow mm -hmm. like i do you know, I'm a generator. I love to do what I love all day, go hard, go to sleep. She needs time to rest and reflect and like have quiet time. And I'm so glad that I did that. So again, to your point, yeah, we parent from what we know and what our conditioning is, but not necessarily for who they are yeah. as their own people. And so as much as I can, I try to nurture her nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's a reflector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see how that how that's complicated. Is that is that what the one? Not the super rare one. There's the generator, the reflector, the projector, 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 or the I mean, she's a projector. I think the reflector is like the super rare, like only two percent of people. I think she's a projector. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyhow. It's more of us generators and manifestor generators. And yeah, it's just like anything else. I think it's more understanding that every human has a different way of being in the world and also having so much compassion for your desire for her to experience the best life that she could and you wanting that for her. And sometimes maybe not tuning into what she is saying that she wants because there is still that conditioning of I know best, mama knows best. <laughs> yeah, so true. Oh, she'll tell me when I don't know best. That is for sure. She is incredibly independent. And so that's another thing that I have to, you know, not be a helicopter mom, which is tricky in this day and age with the internet and just in general. It's, it's tricky to like allow them some freedom to be who they are while also still wanting to protect and know what's going on and, you know, shelter in some ways. So yeah. the dance, it's a continual dance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here with us today, Krishna. I'm wondering where can we find you online? Um, certainly everything you probably want to know is just on my website, which is my name. But then I do like to show up mostly on Instagram stories where I would just talk about the things, IFS, Site K, being in nature, whatever else is going on in the day. That's usually where I hang out. And that is when I feel like it. Um, yeah, I don't have other social media places I hang out, but I do have a LinkedIn page and a lot of people do find me there too. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I try to not be online so much, but I love connecting. And so anyone that this might speak to, it's meant to be, and you can find me if you want to. Yeah. And all the all the links are gonna be in the notes of the of the episode and people can find you there. I was thinking, yeah, maybe we should go old school and just, you know, <laughs> my PO box is this one. Just send me letters. <laughs> I will reply whenever I can. <laughs> I'll send a dove. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Your window's open. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, Mar thank you very much, everybody, for being here with us today. Thank you, Krishna, and looking forward to seeing everybody on the next episode.
Thank you, Inka. The best way to support the Healer Hub podcast is to review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and share it with your people. Thank you so much. Deeply grateful for your support. Thank you.